Skoda's first battery electric vehicle is finally here. This is the Enyaq. It's available as a coupe SUV initially with a few different versions to choose from. In this review, I'll tell you everything you need to know, including the EV driving range, the charging specs, the best competitors to this car, and plenty more. So if you haven't already, please ring the bell and hit like as well. And let's get to it, shall we? In Australia at launch, there are two different versions of the Skoda Enyaq available. Both of them are the coupe style SUV. The more practical wagon style model is probably gonna be on sale in 2025 and it will probably have a lower price tag. But let's talk about pricing for these coupe style models. There are two, as I said, the entry level one is called Sportline and it gets plenty of great features for its 69,990 RRP. So that includes 21 inch wheels, matrix LED headlights and LED daytime running lights. There's also LED tail lights with sequential indicators. You get a panoramic glass roof, keyless entry, push button start. And on the inside, you're also getting a 13 inch touchscreen media system with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. You've got a wireless phone charger in there, digital instrument display too, and sat nav is offered as standard as well. And a nice micro fleece trim on the inside too with driver's electric seat adjustment as well. Now, if you want a little bit more, you can spend $6,000 to get an extra package on the base model version, which gets you the crystal face LED grill, which I personally don't like, but apparently people do. And it also gets you a oomphier sound system, augmented reality, head up display, massaging and memory settings for the driver's seat, electric passenger seat adjustment as well, and a few other features that add a bit of value. And at the top of the range is the RS model, which gets all of that stuff and it gets a sportier look on the outside, different 21 inch wheels, and it also gets a front motor as well as the rear motor. So it's all wheel drive and it does have a fair bit more grunt. We'll get to that later later on, but let's talk about some alternatives to the Enyaq, shall we? The obvious alternative here is the Tesla Model Y, and it starts at a much, much lower price point. It's a very practical electric family SUV with a huge boot and a front trunk and lots of space on the inside and controls that you might hate, but um, it isn't necessarily gonna suit everyone, but the price might. It starts at about $55,000, so a fair bit less money than this. You can get a long range version of that car for similar money to the entry level version of this and the performance version of the Model Y is about the same price as the RS. So if you are a bit of an enthusiast, you might want to go and check out the Kia EV6. It also has a bunch of different variants available, rear wheel drive, all wheel drive, a GT high spec model, but it's a hundred thousand bucks, but it is a very, very fast and performance focused model, that one. So I reckon that it does stack up pretty well, the EV6, and there's a facelift for it on its way, or probably might even be out by the the time you watch this. So it could stack up beautifully for you. Um, but another one I reckon you should check out is the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Now I think that the Ioniq 5 has a beautiful design inside and out. It's just been updated with some new features, a new look, and it's still very, very spacious, but it does have a much smaller battery for its entry level version. And you can work your way all the way up to the Ioniq 5N if you wish, but that's like 120 grand. And it's a very, very different type of car to this. But which one of those would you pick or would you wait because there's much, much, much more coming in the world of EVs. Just to name a few, you might want to wait for the Volkswagen ID Buzz or the Volkswagen ID4 or the Volkswagen ID5 or maybe the Cupra Tavascan or any number of other models that are coming soon. Maybe now isn't the right time to go and buy a brand new EV. It looks big, this car, and look, it isn't that big. It's about 4.7 meters long, so the same size as most other mid-sized SUVs, but um, it just has a bulky look to it. And I don't know whether I like the look of it personally, but you can tell me what you think in the comments. This one is the base model, but with the extra package, so it gets that LED light-up grille. Yeah, that's a bit too chintzy for my tastes, but I do like the LED lights. I do like the 21-inch wheels. And I mean, I'm not so hot on the whole SUV coupe thing, but you can tell me what you think about it in the comments. The back end design, again, I think that the wagon model looks better personally, but let's have a look in the boot and see what we are dealing with. It is a Skoda, so practicality should be at the forefront. 
and it is. So you can see on screen now the amount of cargo capacity that is on offer in here. That is a very, very spacious boot area. And you do get the cargo netting system as standard. It comes at no extra cost. And also at no extra cost, your charge cables. Yes, you get a Mode 2 and a Mode 3 cable in this little Skoda branded bag, which can stay holstered in there if you wish. And you've also got other handy things in the back here. Some shopping bag hooks, some remote release releases for those back seats if you want to fold them down and you've also got uh, another set of shopping bag hooks and a 12 volt port. All right, I'm just gonna have to discombobulate this a little bit and move some of these nets so I can show you what's underneath this boot floor. Right, the big reveal. Um, storage space, which is handy. You might want to put your cables in there so they're not up there in the way and underneath there more storage space just have a look at how much room there is underneath the boot floor but you guessed it that means there is no spare wheel in this car and that could be something that might rule it out for you but otherwise it's very very practical with plenty of space back there and a ski port too Skoda Australia says that the whole point of the interior of this car is that it feels familiar to existing Skoda buyers. And let me tell you, I've sat in pretty much every other Skoda that's on sale, and yes, it does. It does feel largely very similar, and I love that about it because it doesn't feel like you're sitting in some kind of science experiment when it comes to the interior. Sure, there are some changes that you need to be mindful of, though. Things like this big screen, this 13-inch touchscreen media system, which does take a little bit more learning than some of the uh, older tech systems in existing models in the range, but I still think that you will get used to it pretty easily. Um, things that I like about it, so you can set up some drop-down boxes here with your favorites. Uh, all of that makes things a little bit easier. So for instance, if you wanted to set up the lane keep system to be in there as one of your favorites, you could do that. You just have to fit finish and then if you wanted to turn lane keep off, you could just turn it off like that. But there's also another shortcut there, so you can just turn it off there. And I mean, not everyone hates lane keep as much as I do, but I don't hate it. I just think that it isn't as good as I am at driving. Um, look, there's also a car settings menu here, which has heaps of different information available to you. So you can dive into the vehicle diagnostics and changes that you might want to make to the car itself. Um, and that's a bit of a glimpse of what to expect in terms of the efficiency stuff. There is a lot more there that you might want to play with. There's also a home button here uh, where you can adjust things to go back to this home screen. And I mean, there's lots and lots of menus on menus here, which I don't think um, are necessary per se, but you will get used to interacting with it. Otherwise, if you've got CarPlay connected, you can just hit the bottom button down there and that will take you back to where you need to be. And if you want to turn on your seat heating, you have to do that through buttons on the screen. Um, yes, the buttons are a little bit tetchy, uh, but you will get used to them. And at least you get this home bar down the bottom, which the always on part of this screen is the climate controls. Uh, but you still have to do a bit of diving in order to get into things that you might want to turn off. So if you want to turn off the fan, you well, you have to put on on and then do that. Um, it's far less easy than if it was just an actual knob or dial, but we're obviously past that point when it comes to these cars. Down here, there are some buttons, thankfully, some quick buttons that you might want to play with. Obviously, yes, you still do have demisters available through there, and that's a shortcut button. If you want to go back into the climate screen, you can just hit that climber button there. And that one there is your assistance system. So all your safety assist technology is adjustable in there or turn offable. Um, yes, it does have an attention monitor. Um, so if you take your eyes off the road, there's a little camera somewhere here that keeps an eye on your eyes and says, hey, pay attention. And that can be a little bit annoying. It can even interrupt you from interacting with this screen when it thinks that you're distracted. But hey, um, too bad, I guess. There's your auto parking button if you choose one of the cars with the auto park system. There's wireless phone charger down there. Cup holders here with a little card holder that you could put your parking ticket in. And there's another parking ticket holster up there. Uh, yes, you do have a decent sized center console bin here. Some spots for coins if you need to put coins in there. Uh, down there, you'll see that there's a pretty decent sized console area as well for extra storage. And in here, there's another storage area 
with a little section down the bottom there, which is actually uh, removable if you want to take it out. So there's plenty of little storage gadgets and gizmos and options in this car. And I guess we've come to expect that from Skoda, haven't we? Now, these seats, they are very, very comfortable, supportive, and offer a lovely trim. This micro fleece trim is really, really lovely. Uh, if you want or need leather, you'll need to step up to the high grade version. You still get some leather accented elements to these seats, but they're super, super comfy and the interior trim, I mean, I think it's very, very well done. It's not necessarily blingy or too outlandish, but I think that's exactly what it needed to be for a Skoda customer. There's also decent sized bottle holders in the doors, as you can see, with a nice finish that runs up the door. And yes, it all feels pretty nice. There is a digital instrument cluster as well, and that gives you a bit of an info at a glance view of things. You can adjust the way that looks if you don't like that, but it is a very small screen. But if you choose the version that has the augmented reality head up display, that's it there. It sits in your line of sight. And when you have your sat nav instructions on, they'll come up there and sort of point which way you're supposed to go. It's kind of neat technology that I would say. Uh, now, also up here, you do have illuminated vanity mirrors. Good to see. There's also these touch sensitive lights, which are very, very handy to use. Uh, no sunglasses holder, which is, might be a bit of a shame for some, but you do get this massive panoramic glass roof. Sadly, no shade on there, but uh, the brand says that you don't need a shade because it's got some protection built into the glass. But even so, might be a tester on a really hot day. All right, let's check out the back seat space, shall we? Just before we jump in the back seat, yeah, of course, you also get an umbrella in the door. Very, very tidy. This seat is set for my driving position. I'm 182 centimeters or six foot tall. I've got plenty of foot room, decent knee room as well. But let's talk about headroom. It's okay, it's a little bit tight. Um, if you are really tall or if you have really tall kids, uh, they might not be as comfortable back here. But this big glass roof does give that feeling of airiness. Really nice sky out there right now. And I mean, I think it'll be okay for most people's needs. You do get nice things like these grab handles with a coat hook and also these touch sensitive lights. That's really bright uh, in the back as well. Now, other backseat amenities that you wanna know about, there are ISOFIX points in the window seats. There's three top tether points as well. That flip down armrest with some cup holders and oh, someone spilled something there and the ski port there, as I said. Now, yes, you've also got these directional air vents and there's climate control back here as well and you get seat heaters as well if you choose the base model with the option pack or standard if you buy the rs now it does have a flat floor but for some reason skoda has decided well let's fill that gap up with something that gets in the way uh, it's okay it's a removable tray um, and it's got some cup holders and a bit of storage caddy stuff going on there so i mean You'll probably get rid of that if you don't like it, but it is still adding a little bit of practicality to what is otherwise still a pretty practical back seat. Now, there's also these sun blinds as standard on all grades, which is nice to see. And you've got decent size bottle holders in the doors, soft finishes on the elbow pads, like to see that. Matte pockets on the seat backs as well with little device holders. So yeah, it's a pretty practical back seat. All right, let's talk about powertrain options for the new Enyaq. There is a single motor rear wheel drive entry level version, which has 210 kilowatts and 545 Newton meters of torque. That is plenty. And it's rear wheel drive comes with a single speed transmission. And let me tell you, it's gonna be enough for most people's needs. You see the not to hundred time on your screen now. It's no slow thing. It is a bit heavy though. I'll put the weight on your screen now as well. And if you are wondering what the RS adds to the equation, well, it adds an extra motor and that means a fair bit more power 250 kilowatts but more torque as well all combined it could end up being 679 newton meters if it all works together but they don't state that as an official number yes it's all wheel drive still with a single speed transmission 0 to 100 for it is a fair bit quicker as well but it's also heavier because it's got extra weight from that electric motor and a few extra specs as well and if you're wondering the rs can tow a little bit more as well i put the figures for both versions on your screen now so you can see for yourself if you could make that work for yourself all right let's talk range and charging stuff 
Right, so the rear-wheel drive versions of the Enyaq have a very, very good amount of EV driving range. You'll see the WLTP stated combined figure on your screen, but I'm also going to put up the city figure for the rear-wheel drive models because that's almost 700 kilometres of EV driving range because you'll call on those regen brakes quite a bit more in city driving. The all-wheel drive RS has a bit less range, it is heavier and it's prioritising power over range, but has hey, it's still very much usable. You'll see the numbers on your screen. Now, let's talk about charging because you do have fairly good charging specs for this car. You've got a Type 2 combination plug. Yes, that means AC charging up top at a maximum rate of 11 kilowatts. And that is pretty good. It means that you will need three-phase power in order to take advantage of the 11 kilowatt max charge rate. You'll see how long it should take at 11 kilowatts on your screen now. And if you're wondering, yes, there is DC charging. If you want to go to a rapid charger and top up, um, the maximum rate is actually pretty good for this car. It's better than the previous versions that were available in Europe, in fact. So I guess we've had some advantage for waiting. And there's no difference between the all-wheel drive versions and the rear-wheel drive versions when it comes to the charging capabilities. So even the rear-wheel drive entry-level versions seem to stack up pretty well when it comes to the charging specs and definitely when it comes to EV driving range. So let's go for a drive and see how efficient it really is. Okay, so right now I am in the rear-wheel drive version with the option pack. I don't necessarily think it's the one I would buy. I would buy the base model. Yep, no option pack needed and no adaptive suspension needed because I'm impressed with the suspension in the standard car. That one just seems to be the pick in terms of the level of driving joy that you can find. You don't need the adaptive suspension. Sure, it's nice to have in some situations, but the standard passive dampers are actually really, really impressive. And the rear wheel drive system just gives you more feel through the steering. It's got a lighter action in terms of the steering feel. And it also means that it feels a bit more dynamic and a bit more nimble. Like I know that the RS model has more power, but more power is not always more fun. It just means that you've got more to deal with, more to handle, more to think about. And this rear wheel drive version of the Enyaq for that reason is the one that stands out to me because it just does a really good job of managing the power. And in terms of the handling, the ride, the steering, I think that it's just a really sweet combo that base model car and for that reason it's the one that I would wholeheartedly suggest you take a look at first and foremost if you decide that you want those extra features in the option pack sure fine it's only six grand more it doesn't necessarily make it a bank breaker so it could be worth it to you but for me I just find that you know 70,000 bucks is still a lot of money for an electric car and I think that the rear wheel drive base model would probably be still the best car in the range in terms of the drive experience on the whole. Um, now look, you do have to pay a little bit of a penalty with anything that's this large, this heavy, and that has 21 inch wheels with low profile tires. That's just physics, right? So it doesn't have necessarily the most perfect ride, but it does have a pretty comfortable ride and surprisingly comfortable considering the size of the wheels. Um, I think that for most people's needs in most driving scenarios, it's gonna be absolutely amenable to day-to-day -day life. Um, we've done a mix of driving today on this test drive outside of Sydney and I've come away from it really, really impressed by all versions of this car. But like I said, the rear wheel drive ones are the ones that stand out a little more. I did drive the RS model in some spirited situations and yeah, you do get a fair bit more snot. There is a lot more power and torque available to you, but it does feel a tad heavier. And it does also feel like you don't get the same sort of natural progressive steering that you do in the rear wheel drive versions because it has to do steering and powering at the front axle. So all of that means basically what I already said, the rear wheel drive one is the one I would suggest you look at. 
Now, what about other elements of the drive experience across all versions? Well, there's a little bit of road noise to contend with, but it's not too bad considering that, you know, 21 inch wheels, full EV, so it's silent, but it has road roar. So that's something you want to keep in mind. Uh, and also the brake pedal feel, I just still struggle to get to the point where I really, really trust that the brakes are going to do what I want because they have regen braking built into the system. What that means is the top of the pedal always has this sort of airy feeling. You never feel quite like you've got the same sort of bitiness that you might have experienced in other Skodas in the past. Um, so if you are thinking about trading up from an existing Skoda, you might find that the brakes are the thing that maybe take a little bit more getting used to than you might have otherwise thought. But that regen braking system also has a few different settings available. Uh, so you can set it up to be basically almost a single pedal driving mode. Uh, it won't come to a complete stop when you do lift off, but if you put the shifter down here into B mode, it will come to almost a complete stop. Let's do it now. So we're in B mode, the regen brakes are on their most assertive level, and we are crawling to a well, walking pace, 5Ks an hour or so. So look, I mean, there are other EVs out there that might tick your box a little bit more in terms of the regen brakes and having the single pedal driving mode with full stop and start capability. But I think that this still is very, very good in terms of the brake uh, usability, in terms of the regen brake usability. Like I said, the brake pedal feel just needs maybe a little bit more work. But otherwise, I am impressed. I think that the Skoda Enyaq does offer a different level of driving joy that some of those other rivals maybe don't. And I certainly think that it does stand out to be a nicer car to drive and a nicer car to sit in than a Model Y, for instance. All right, so what about efficiency figures? Well, the on-paper numbers for this car are very, very impressive, considering it is a pretty large SUV that's pretty heavy and has pretty large wheels with low-profile tyres, which never necessarily aids the efficiency that you can get out of a car like this. But the numbers that you'll see on your screen for the rear-wheel drive and all-wheel drive models show that this car is efficient, at least in the WLTP testing. But on this test that I've been doing, I've driven all three variants, and I'm gonna put all three numbers on your screen, but we'll do the rear-wheel drive ones first. So the rear-wheel drive, standard and with the pack. And yeah, I was absolutely blown away with that figure. That really impressed me. And also the all-wheel drive RS, which, you know, it's the performance one, and it's still very, very efficient. This car, surprisingly efficient, I would say. And look, I haven't had a chance to do a full long distance range test, but the range numbers seem to stack up pretty well. And like I said earlier on, the city claimed EV driving range at almost 700 Ks because it calls on the regen brakes a lot more in city driving. That could be the thing that gets you across the line for this car. Impressive. This car has a five-star Euro NCAP safety rating from a few years ago, and also a five-star ANCAP safety rating, but that's for the New Zealand delivered versions. There is no ANCAP rating for Aussie cars at the time I'm filming this, but that may change very, very soon. Now, all versions do come with heaps of standard safety technology and equipment, things like autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. There's adaptive cruise control with traffic jam assistance, and that means that the lane keeping system can steer for you while while the adaptive cruise stops and starts for you in some situations. That's pretty high-tech stuff. There's blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert, a reversing camera, parking sensors, and if you choose the optional package on the base model, you also get a surround view camera, sorry about the crows, and also there's a self-parking system if you option that package. All of that comes standard on the RS grade, and it does seem to stack up pretty well from the tech perspective. None of it's annoying as well, which is really, really handy, and there's eight airbags fitted to this car, dual front, front side, rear side, and full length curtain coverage. Nice. Skoda is the only European brand in Australia to offer a seven year unlimited kilometer warranty. That's the same level of cover you get if you buy an Enyaq, but you also get an eight year 160,000 K warranty for the battery pack, the high voltage battery pack, which has a degradation guarantee of 70%. So 
If you have heard those rumors about EV batteries not being reliable or not lasting a very long time, well, that should put your mind at ease when it comes to that kind of nonsense. Now, in terms of the servicing intervals, it's every two years and 30,000 kilometers. Yes, EVs do require a lot less maintenance and the brand is offering eight years or 10 years of prepaid servicing available for this car. And both of those packages are pretty cheap. You'll see the prices on your screen now. Another thing I just wanna call out about the Skoda option here is that you do have the choice to finance through the brand and you'll be able to set a guaranteed future value. Now, I know that resale values for EVs is something that plays on the mind of a lot of potential consumers. And this could help you maybe put your mind at ease a little bit because you can sign up to a one, two, three, four or five year term and you can set the parameters for how much you'll drive the car and guarantee how much it'll be worth at the end of that loan. So all of that seems to stack up pretty well in terms of the consumer and ownership side of things. But tell me what you think in the comments section below. There's no denying that the new Skoda Enyaq is a very good thing. I really like how it drives, especially the rear wheel drive models. And in fact, I think that the base model with no extras, no options is the one I would go for. Not just because it's the best price, but because it seems like really good value. Tell me what you think about it in the comments section below. Would you choose the entry level model, the RS, or one of those alternatives I mentioned earlier on? If you haven't already, please ring the bell and stay tuned for more content. Let me know if there's any other EVs that you'd like me to review in the comments as well. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.